So the last, uh, last but not least, is the person who is the referee. One of the referees, of course, she's not alone. She comes from the broad universe called the European Medicines Agency. Susanna Vidic comes from the Slovenian Medicines Agency. The acronym is YAZMP. And um, we were very happy to have her on the panel we had uh, at, the end of, at the end of May. So we realized that everything is progressing. Regulation is progressing. Uh, uh, experts have to learn. Uh, patients are learning. So thank you for being with us again, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you to organizers for inviting me. It's uh, a big pleasure that um, I can give you some insights in the regulation of ATMP at this, I think, uh, very important event. So just a lit little to introduce myself. So um, I'm assessor at the agency, Slovenian Agency for the Medi Medicinal Products and Medical Devices, uh, assessor for biologicals, including ATMPs. So um, the organizer asked me to give you some insight also in the uh, possibilities for the earlier access to these um, uh, important medicines. But uh, I may also give you as an assessor some perspective uh, in this way. Um, so if I just start from the beginning, um, the regulation on advanced medicinal products um, uh, was adopted in 2007 already, so and was uh, assigned for from 2008. So from then, these all ATMPs, um, which are developed or should be marketed, uh, should get actually marketing authorization. Uh, the main aim of this regulation was to protect the human health and rights. And also on the other side, um, to allow that all medicines uh, that are available, um, that these are available, available to patients across the whole Europe. So for this reason, um, the, uh, the idea of regulation is that the marketing authorization of ATMPs can be obtained via a centralized procedure uh, which means the application needs to be submitted to European Medicine Agency. And this means it's a one application, one assessment, and for the successful applications, one marketing um, authoriz authorization, which is valid in all member states. So how does it work, this um, uh, procedure? So for the assessment of the product, uh, there are several several experts involved, not only from the European Medicine Agency, but also from the national competent authorities. Those are teams of experts, which are team of reporter and a team of co, co who do who do um, the assessment independently, and then they get it together. Um, during the assessment procedures are also involved the uh, experts uh, as member of committee of advanced therapy and also from the committee of pharmacovigilance risk assessment committee and from the committee for medicinal products for human use so all these committees and experts from national competent authorities during the assessment procedure collaborate and in the end the chmp is the committee who gives a positive or negative opinion uh, on the medicine. And then this is sent to the uh, European Commission, which makes the final decision. But marketing authorization is not an obligation for marketing of the medicinal product in the member state. This is the decision of um, marketing authorization holder in the end. So although there might be approved medicinal product, approved ATMP, but not necessarily to be available in your country. But yeah, we heard a little already about this. If we look from the um, product development perspective, yes, it takes very long time. It includes pharmaceutical and non-clinical development, um, 
phase one clinic and two clinical development, phase three clinical development, and then is submission of application. I I have to say that actually very much effort, not only because we heard a lot about the non-clinical development, but a lot of effort needs to be put also on the pharmaceutical development, but development besides clinical development, because pharmaceutical development is very important from the perspective that the um, developers need to show in the end that the production process is consistent, despite the fact that for the 18 piece we know that the starting materials or many raw materials are of biological origin, which means they introduce a lot of variability in this production process. But in the end, there should be kind of consistent process and the manufacturer should end up with the specifications which are scientifically sound and this should be uh, for the identity content, for the purity, impurities, for the biological activities, all these are important things. And I have to admit as an assessor that usually we end up, no matter whether it's a clinical trial application or is a marketing authorization application, most of the questions we end up on the quality part besides clinical part. Uh, on clinical part, there are many questions mainly related to the clinical study, selection of the clinical study population uh, in relation to the selected uh, therapeutic indication. Also on the selection of dosage, frequency uh, of the dose, dosing on the treatment, the duration, all these kind of things also on the administration route of application of the drug. So all these things needs to have some scientific rationale, which is of course also um, uh, based on some non-clinical studies. So it is very important that drug development goes through all these phases if we want to have a product that is safe and effective in the end. So when we have, when the application is submitted, uh, so we look at the data, there should be comprehensive data with respect to the quality non-clinical from the safety and efficacy. And um, when, did, when, the, uh, when we have this comprehensive data, we can make uh, assessment of the benefit and risk. And if this uh, ratio is positive, then the marketing authorization can be granted. Uh, in case of ATMP uh, medicinal product, it always many times happens that the marketing authorization holder is obliged also to do some post-marketing uh, efficacy and safety studies. This is mainly due to the fact that uh, ATMPs are very complex molecules, so there should be still some additional data to be generated collector on the heterogeneous study population. So this is what usually happens. But looking at that, let's ask, can we, are there any opportunities with this, within this regulatory framework that in some certain circumstances, um, the patients can get, get, can get um, um, uh, promising medicines earlier? Yes. So the answer is yes. So within the regulatory framework, there are some regulatory uh, opportunities which are mainly ca categorized uh, between regulatory tools. Uh, those have um, um, uh, legal provisions that are foreseen in the um, uh, legislations. On the other side, there are also several uh, supporting activities that are run or by uh, uh, European Medicine Agency or by national competent authorities. So regarding the supporting activities, I think it was already mentioned today, it is very important that uh, developers get in contact with the regulator very early in the development, mainly because to avoid any development failures, to actually plan the development of the product in a way that in the end, the success of the marketing authorization would, would be uh, much higher in the end. But 
I would like to give some insight also in these regulatory tools. So if, ah, yeah, so for these regulatory tools, what are the main drivers, criteria that can be used to for early patient access? So different regulatory tools have different criteria to be uh, eligible for that, but in, in principle, this is, uh, this should address unmet medical need, or it should be major public health interest, or the medicine should be uh, important therapeutic uh, innovation, or um, the medicine should address uh, seriously debilitating or life-threatening disease, um, or if it's um, orphan medicine, et, et cetera. Um, so if we look at the conditional marketing authorization, the, it is not specific for ATMPs, but it's also applicable to ATMPs. Uh, for those, the authorization can um, be given before the comprehensive data are available. So in order to address unmet medical need, uh, but in the, this is possible if the benefits of the early access would outweigh the risk due to the limited information that we have about the product. Uh, in this way, some medicines can be authorized several years earlier, but it is the main criteria is also that uh, we know that the additional data that will be gen generated, mainly the clinical data that still needs to be generated, that this will be um, uh, possible to uh, provide them in certain period of time. Uh, another criteria is also that uh, it addresses and met medical needs, and this should be um, for the debilitating or light threatening disease. And uh, yeah, as I said, it should be very likely that the data will be provided. The conditional marketing authorization, uh, it's uh, first valid for one year, then the um, marketing authorization holder uh, get specific obligation that needs to be um, fulfilled in certain period of time. So after one year, this conditional marketing authorization is extended. And when the old data are collected, um, then again, the benefit balance is weighted. And in, if it's still positive, confer if confirming to be positive, then after several years or three, four, five, the conditional marketing authorization can be converted to standard marketing authorization. Another regulatory tool, which also could a little bit speed up the access of the medicinal promising medicinal product, um, it's the accelerated assessment. As I have shown before, even the assessment process is not so quick. It can take a year or two, depending how much uh, issues are there. But in principle, when we look at the standard procedure, it takes assessment 210 days. These are only the active days of assessment. You have to know when the first list of questions comes, there is a clock stop. So the, mark, uh, the applicant has time to respond to all these questions or maybe do some additional studies. And when it comes back, it's a second round and it takes another 60 days of assessment, et cetera. But for the accelerate procedure, particularly, particularly for the ATMPs, uh, this uh, timeline of assessment is shortened. It's about 220 day, uh, 250 days in of active uh, assessment days. But for this accelerate assessment, it goes very much in line with the supporting activities that are available to developers, meaning that the data should be quite mature enough when the submission is, um, uh, when the uh, application is submitted, which means that the um, developer should be always, all the time in contact with the regulator. Uh, so being, or having scientific advices, several scientific advices, or being part of this prime program, which means that the regulators uh, are involved in this, drug development pipeline very from the beginning of the uh, development so that the um, uh, development is planned 
in a way that as much as possible fulfills the regulatory requirement. Still, during the if the assess during the assessment, if it turns out that there are still several issues coming up, then this uh, accelerated assessment can be converted to standard assessment. So looking at this scheme, you can I just want to show you. So these are all the products, ATMPs that were approved in Europe since 2009 to 2000, uh, 2023. Uh, some of them are not available on the market anymore, not because of the reason of efficacy or safety, but mainly because of the uh, commercial reasons. So the marketing authorization holder decided to not um, uh, market the product. But what I wanted to show you mainly is that in the last years, the number of products that are authorized, ATMP products, um, the number is increasing. And I have to uh, say that many of those uh, products were part of these um, accelerated uh, regulatory tours, tools. So, and also many of those products uh, were part of scientific advices before the application submission or were part of prime program. So all these regulatory tools were used so that the medicines could get uh, earlier to the market. So all what I was saying, saying uh, up to now was mainly based to this centralized procedure, but there are st still some alternative regulatory pathways in, that are in the remit of national competent authorities. And these alternative regulatory pathways also have uh, legal provisions that are foreseen in the legislation. So one of them is um, non-routine preparation of ATMPs. It's specific for the ATMPs. And with other words, it is, uh, it is called hospital exemption. Exemption mainly because it is meant to be used a uh, custom-made ATMP that is prepared from time to time uh, in case that there is no ATMP marketed in Europe. Um, so the product should be uh, used for the individual patients in a hospital under the responsibility of the medical doctor who prescribes the medicine. And the national competent authorities um, approves the preparation of such ATMPs, but still this um, um, hospital exemption needs to fulfill criteria regarding the quality, traceability, pharmacovi pharmacovigilance, which are equivalent to those uh, required for the marketing authorization. Uh, the, Important thing is also that for this non-routine preparation of ATMPs, they should be prepared within the member state where the, uh, this medicine is used. Another alternative regulatory pathway, uh, which is not specific for ATMPs, but it's still uh, a way how to accelerate uh, access, it's a compassionate use program. It's uh, used for the treatment option that allows the use of new innovative uh, med medicines that are not still uh, authorized by European Commission. Um, the main idea is that um, the uh, medicines that are used within this compassionate use program should be in already in the late phase of development or should be already in the pro process of obtaining market marketing uh, authorization application. Um, one of the criteria is that uh, it should address uh, therapeutic um, innovation and it should also address um, to be treated for to be used for patients with chronic or seriously debilitating disease ca that cannot be um, treated with other um, uh, drugs that are approved and also as usually with regard to benefit risk although we do not have the all information about this uh, product there should be a clear sign that there will be a potential benefit from the treatment uh, when used within the compassionate use program. 
I would also add some other options, which I have to say are not so much frequent in relation to ATMPs, but would just like to let you know that there are some other regulatory pathways. One of um, them is a treatment on a name page patient basis. Actually, um, here is again that the medical doctor decides for use of new drug, new med medicine, uh, which is obtained from the manufacturer directly. But it's actually very much dependent how it, this um, regulatory uh, pathway is um, regulated within the, each member state. For example, in Slovenia, uh, this uh, named patient basis can be only uh, applicable for medicines which are authorized outside the Europe. So it should at least have authorization in Canada or USA or Japan, but every country has uh, its own uh, legal decision on this uh, pathway. There are also options of expanded access programs not necessarily every country has this option, depending what is in the legislation, but it's meant to be for the medicines which are already in the clinical um, uh, trials. And if, when the, if some patients have very much benefit from the treatment during the clinical trial, which will, be, which will end at a certain point, and if medical doctor thinks that some patient would require uh, to continue with this medicine, this is one of the options. And now I would also like to touch upon clinical trials. Um, there are quite a lot of clinical trials also in Europe with ATMPs. And I have to say that um, clinical trials when we talk about development of new drug or new medicine, we need to think about clinical trials because this is the most reliable way to get information about the efficacy and safety of the novel medicinal product. Uh, in this respect, also the patient should always be considered for uh, being included in the clinical trials before being offered um, before mentioned hospital exemption or um, compassionate use program. The main reason is that clinical trials, regulation of clinical trials is designed in a way that um, patients that will be included in, cl in clinical trial uh, will have minimal risk when exposed to this novel medicinal product or you know, um, investigational medicinal product. And at the same time, they should benefit as much as possible from this uh, investigational medicinal product based on the level of information of, uh, that we have at that time about this product. But never, nevertheless, it's... Uh, um, it should be a priority way for, um, for the patients to be included in clinical trials. Um, so basically to conclude on this uh, regulation aspects for the use of ATMPs, um, for all these ATMPs, the pharmaceutical legislation applies only if it's differently written in the regulation for ATMPs. Um, no matter whether it's a marketing authorization application or whether it's a clinical trial application or whether it's a um, hospital exemption, there's, it's a possibility of the risk-based approach because of the complexity of these uh, medicines. Um, good manufacturing practice and good clinical practice always applies no matter which of those regulatory tools is uh, chosen. And um, there is also needs to be the pharmacovigilance in place as well as risk management plan and traceability. And the last but not the least, no matter whether it's a marketing authorization or is a clinical trial application or it's a hospital exemption or other way of um, using um, the regulatory to tool, the benefits should outweigh the risk for patients. So I hope I have given you some 
uh, incentives that um, drug development, even for ATMPs, uh, can be uh, facilitated. And I really wish you a lot of success in, on that pathway.